Hello, everyone. So for the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going actually to talk about design and the challenges that the design discipline is facing in developing a real empathetic understanding of planetary ecology and propose a shift in design focus from exclusively the human to include also all the other species that are um, inhabiting the planet together with us. I will also touch upon the idea of work as a tool to evaluate the interaction between human and non-humans when connected by production. So while the act of design can be defined as the innate uh, ability of humans to conceive but also perform desired changes in their environment, um, the discipline of design evolved in conjunction with industrial revolution. And design has basically based its development on one big um, notion, which is the one of human well-being and the concepts of needs. In fact, when it's best, design is a fantastic discipline for the improvement of the life of citizens. Nevertheless, product development has been undertaken based on the market conception of the needs of citizens transformed in consumers as endless as the energetic resource availability. The anthropocentric dimension of design, in this sense, it is not only intrinsic, but actually it has been theorized by the discipline of design itself. The complex organization of the world, according to design, seems to depend only on human needs, and therefore all other beings and objects on planet Earth are subordinated to human will. Obviously, this very user-centered perspective finds troubles in addressing the challenges that a sustainable future entails, since they are in basic conflict with the idea that we are cohabiting on an equal manner on the planet with other species. Nevertheless, we still think it is interesting to actually um, understand how the discipline of design evolved over the years, to actually understand if design can become uh, less anthropocentric in, this, in some ways inclusive of other species. If we talk about and we think about design in terms of design education, it's impossible not to mention the College of Ulm, since it's probably one of the most known and influential examples of the integration of science and art to create a structured problem-solving approach revolving around the needs of humans. So despite being extremely anthropocentric still, the College of Ulm was fantastic in creating a much more holistic perspective on design, and specifically under the, the directorship of Maldonado, dropped the accent on the artist that instead was introduced by Max Bill. The confluence of artists, scientists, and philosophers in the college was an attempt to establish a multidisciplinary debate on the social function of design. If on one side the program was definitely preoccupied with the reconstruction of West Germany after the war, on the other side it was also very much um, questioning uh, the uh, fundamental role that uh, product development might have in consumerism. The tension between the transformative power of design and at the same time its participation in consumption was in this sense a very early debate within the design discipline and still regularly examined. The necessity of addressing real human needs as opposed to the invented needs created by the market, for instance, was largely investigated by Viktor Papanek throughout his whole career, but also in his book, Design for the Real World. In it, Papanek described how design could be incorporated in too many areas of life, and also how to apply uh, design as a tool to fight social injustice in developing countries. For instance, this is a small radio that he created for developing countries just with found objects. Um, Papanek was also uh, interested in understanding the consequences of design and production in the environment, nevertheless maintaining a very user-centered, in a way, anthropocentric vision of design. And he himself was defining design as a conscious effort to impose a meaningful order on the world. And it's from these premises that design evolved in, as a discipline, at least in the most avant-garde and ethically responsible educations, in a socially engaged discipline. In this sense, I think it is interesting to confront these two educational charts. One is from the early Bauhaus, and the other is from the Design Academy in Eindhoven, uh, where I'm actually also teaching, and it is considered at the forefront of innovation in design. If we confront them, the 
uh, subdivisions of the departments actually according to materials or techniques is completely gone. Nevertheless, the human is still placed in the center and actually the departments are still named, for instance, as men and living men and mobility and, and so on. In her text, Staying with the Trouble, Donna Haraway identifies in the capacity uh, to respond to encounters with non-human beings thoughtfully and with an expansive notion of kindship as a vital way to learn to live in troubled times or in the Cthulhu scene, which is her preferred word for the Anthropocene, which she finds as a word and as an idea, implicitly emboldens instead in taming human exceptionalism. And we believe it is still, uh, despite this very traditional framework, within uh, education and also in independent design practices, that we can see designer investigating the possibilities of multi-species collaborations. I will now just uh, uh, explain a few examples where I see the human and animals intersecting to create meaningful outcome. Uh, this work, for instance, was developed at the RCA here in London uh, between 2007 and 2009 by Susanna Soares in the um, um, department, uh, Design Interaction Department, the RCA. And it was an investigation into the uh, terrific abilities of bees of detecting uh, very specific uh, smells within uh, human breath, and also biomarkers associated with certain diseases such as tuberculosis, lung and skin cancer, and diabetes. And so I has created these objects which are supposed to create and help the interactions between human and animals for the detections of illnesses. In 2013, instead, the Mediate Matter Group at the MIT, uh, once it was headed by Neri Oxman, developed the Silk Pavilion. Basically, the structure of the pavilion has been constructed uh, with a robotic arm based on how the silkworms actually deposit uh, silks. And uh, the worms themselves have also been placed on top of the pavilion and they have been finishing the structure depositing silk. Even if these examples are considered in their approach and demonstrate a willingness in addressing design as more inclusive of underestimated species, the question remains if in any case the bees in Suarez's work, but also the worms in the Silk Pavilion are real collaborator, collaborators in a way I think we can say so since uh, their specific intelligence has been applied. Um, or, on the other side, we can still define what they do as unpaid labor. Extending the idea of work and what it entails in terms of rights but also duties uh, to also all the non-humans and even um, uh, objects inhabiting the planet could be an interesting framework for a more complex understanding of the relationship between design, production, and the environment. In 2017, these pictures refer to that, we have been invited as a design studio to take part to a biennial in Ljubljana, a design biennial, and to reflect on the local production and an economy based on limestone. The work became an attempt to quantify the time needed for the production of mundane objects in limestone, considering a less anthropocentric approach where the geological formation of the quarry itself was taken into account. The work was actually departing from a very simple assumption, uh, or hypothesis better, of granting to the quarry the same legal right as a human being, so to recognize the geological time of formation of the quarry itself as work time that should be calculated when even economically quantifying the production of objects from mine limestone. To do so, we collaborated with the local geological institute to date some material fragments. The work became a translation of new scientific knowledge to update the modernist notions of material transparency. More recently, instead, our students at the Contextual Design Department in uh, Eindhoven addressed the ethical complexity of voicing the rights for other species. More specifically, she looked into large-scale tree plantations for the production of furniture and dialogue with biologists at the Wageningen University in Holland to uh, wonder if uh, those plants might have rights as laborers. Departing from a similar context, Tamara Oriola, horrified by the consequences of clear-cutting of forests in her own country, Latvia, both for deforestation but also climate change, question if a less traumatic production could still happen with the forest without actually cutting the plants. She explored a harvesting of fallen pine needles, which accounts between the 20 to the 30% of the total mass of a pine tree for the production of fibers, 
composite materials, papers, and even dyes. Agne Kuzerenkait, instead, applied phytomining and so the ability of plants to actually um, absorb heavy metals from the underground, uh, both to heal intoxicated land, but actually also with the extracted minerals producing um, glazes for architectural surfaces. In all these instances, the vegetal world is not just reduced in an inanimate object, but actually interrogated as a vein, as a design companion, with a new empathetic attitude. Hopefully, these emerging narratives will help to carve a new, deeper understanding of the relationship between design, production, and the environment. Design will obviously remain uh, anthropocentric by nature. Nevertheless, developing a more inclusive and complex narrative is the most sensible way to develop a real ecological thinking beyond sustainability, which is becoming quite a tired concept. And it is within design education where we see the possibility to nurture these very fragile new stories because it is the only place where a certain level of reflection on the possibilities but also the problematics of design and production is still happening. The suggestion here is obviously not to remove the human at the center of those educational charts, rather to include all the other species with whom we are actually sharing planet Earth. Thank you.